I am very glad to welcome back Ted Bohr uh, because uh, after Sandy, we held a briefing looking at the role of CHP and district energy in providing the kind of resilience that stood up during Sandy and brought in um, several people uh, with, who were managing such systems in, in the Northeast. And it was a pretty remarkable story. And so it's great that Ted Bohr is here with us today, uh, who is the energy plant manager at Princeton University. He has more than 32 years of experience in the power industry, is, uh, is a professional engineer, has a whole background, graduate degrees in terms of, of mechanical engineering and many other certifications. But he has been actively involved in campus energy and carbon emission reduction efforts. And I'll never forget his story about what his system was able to do at Princeton during Sandy. And we are so lucky to have him with us today, but for people who operate such systems and have gone through those things and can so clearly tell the story it is so important for us to listen and to learn. And Ted has also been telling the story, uh, has been providing a great example uh, through his talking to many people in, in Congress, uh, in various agencies, as well as in other conferences and meetings and also writing about this in many, many different kinds of publications. Ted? Carol, thanks a lot. So to summarize what she said, Ted's an energy nerd and really likes to talk about this stuff. Are you sufficiently caffeinated? Because we have like 15 minutes to cover an entire college education in terms of uh, energy. Everything that Rob just said, what I'd like to do is say, he said, here's what you can do. And what I want to show you is that this is what Princeton does. This is what Princeton's been doing. Not because we're heavily funded, but because we have enough of a time horizon that we can look forward and say, I want to make a decision out there, not one that causes me to trip over my shoelaces, okay? So really, this is not a red, we're in DC, we're right here in the nation's capital. This is not a red issue, blue issue. This is a, we want to save money and we want to save the planet and the things that we're doing overlap in that space, okay? So you can sell this to either side if you want. It's really not that hard. Um, I want to show you that we get higher reliability. I want to show you one example of a highly integrated microgrid, but as much as the generous introduction suggested, really Princeton is just one example of many, many, many of this is what you can actually do. Oh, and many of these places have been doing this for a long time. Um, and the microgrids, it's sort of three different areas, right? Microgrid, combined heat and power, and district energy, and they all go very nicely together. Um, they offer lots and lots of benefits, most of which you already know about because that's why you're here, but I want to point out a, a few of those. What's a microgrid? Okay, a, a lot of people say, oh, I want to go build a microgrid, and frankly, the, most of them don't even know exactly what that is, but really easy, simple working definition, okay? Uh, on the left-hand side, we've got the power plant that is the central plant operated by the utility. On the right-hand side, the green guys, the happy guys, the ones with the microgrid, they've got some kind of load and some kind of generation behind a meter. They can synchronize to the power grid, and they can offer the power grid services when, not if, when the power grid fails, then they can operate autonomously, okay? So generation plus load behind a meter, ability to synchronize, and ability to operate autonomously, okay? The blue guy, the sad guy, who doesn't have a microgrid, they have a microgrid next door, and in some ways they're able to buy, uh, benefit just by the proximity to someone from a microgrid. And I say that because of our experience, and one that Rob uh, indicated. Because we were able to keep the lights on during Hurricane Sandy, the steam operating, the chilled water operating, the research co uh, continuity, our neighbors, the first responders, were able to come and muster 
at the university, recharge their radios, recharge their phones, get a hot meal, sit indoors where it wasn't raining, make decisions, and then go back out into the community. So even the proximity of a microgrid helps out. You don't have to be the one who owns it. Convince your neighbors to buy one. Um, the university has 180 buildings. Okay, so think of us as a small community representative of something that could scale way up. 180 buildings, 9 million square feet, and sort of one of or several of everything. Uh, administrative and research and athletic. Uh, the only thing, we don't have a hospital, we don't have a dominant um, graduate school that kind of swings the character of the university. It's primarily a very, very strong undergraduate, and about half of our business is research, half of our business is education. The half that's research is tremendously energy intense, and I think that's part of why we value the reliability and the resilience and the continuity of energy. I won't drag you through all the numbers. Uh, what I want you to see is that we produce electricity. We use a gas turbine, that is a jet engine. Uh, this little jet engine was originally designed by General Electric for the stealth fighter, for the F-A-18, and the Blue Angels have these on their wings. So it's a very powerful, very responsive military fighter jet engine that we now strap down to the ground, we keep the engine still, and we use the thrust from the engine to spin an electric generator to make electricity. That process, like Rob indicated, is about one-third efficient. A third of the fuel you put in comes out as useful electricity in most settings, the two-thirds is wasted, all right? So if we wanted to make an apple pie, right, we're gonna buy an apple, we'll cut two-thirds of the apple and throw it away and just use one-third of the apple to make our pie. See, that's kind of wasteful. In Princeton's case, and in most of these cases that we're talking about, we're going to get much more use out of the apple. The only thing we throw away is the core and the seeds, okay? So in Princeton's case, we're gonna buy the apple and one-third goes out and makes uh, electricity, um, I guess that's a bad metaphor, but uh, two-thirds is going to come out as waste heat and we'll recapture most of the heat energy and deliver that to the university as steam. In the winter, we use it as steam. In the summer, we use the steam that's produced as a byproduct of uh, power generation to turn steam turbines to operate our chilled water plant. So we still find ways to exploit the waste heat even in the summer. Um, we also have energy storage. It's very hard to store steam. Uh, we're right on the cusp of finding ways to store electricity cost effectively and space effectively. In fact, we're, we're looking into that right now. But we've, it's very easy to store cold water. So uh, to air condition the university, what we do is we make very cold water. We send it around. It's sort of like the radiator in your car. We use that heat, uh, we use that cold water to pick up heat from the buildings to cool the buildings off. In our case, we store that cold water, so we might make cold water when it's very inexpensive to buy power. We store the cold water until the power is very valuable, until the power price is high, and then we deliver it to the university uh, at, at great cost savings, but also it adds reliability. Everything in the plant will break at some point. So when the chiller breaks, not if the chiller breaks, we can back up and say, well, Reliability trumps ec economics in this moment, so what we're going to do is we're going to run the thermal storage energy, we'll pump it out of our tank, and my campus customers don't feel the problem in the plant. I think of the energy plant as an energy conversion box, right? So on the left-hand side, we buy electricity, we buy natural gas, we buy liquid fuel, we push it through all these energy conversion devices. On the way, we accept a free gift of energy from the sun, we convert that sunlight into electricity and we mix it with the electricity we've made. We send to the campus electricity, steam, and chilled water. District Energy Rob really explained, but we've got a central power plant. The benefit of having a central power plant instead of 180 boilers and 180 chillers around the campus is we centralize all the problems. We centralize the staff, we centralize the tools, we centralize the pollution, the noise, the aesthetic issues, and by centralizing it, now we have an opportunity to control the emissions, the noise, the aesthetic issues, the people. I need a lot fewer people, but I need a more highly trained staff. Very good jobs, very technical jobs. Um, what we find is this costs more to buy up front, and this has a much, much better life cycle cost. So the conversation we need to introduce is the idea of life cycle cost uh, project uh, decision making. You buy expensive up front, 
and you keep it for a century, and it will serve you well for a century. Again, combined heat and power, right? We've got the jet engine on the left-hand side spinning an electric generator. A third of the energy that comes into the gas turbine leaves as electricity. Two-thirds leaves through the catalytic converter, through the heat recovery boiler, and I capture most of the waste heat. So my overall process efficiency can be 70% on average through the year and north of 80%, even, even uh, skating up next to 90% efficient sometimes during the winter. Just to reinforce that idea, I took real measurements off our control system, not sort of theoretical design numbers. So on the left, you can see that our gas turbine producing electricity is anywhere from 30 to 40% uh, efficient. I'll say averaging about 34% efficient. But when I combine the heat and the power production, I'm well above 80% uh, on average through the year. Again, thermal storage, we've got the chiller decoupled from the campus needs. So the chiller and the, and the campus needs are now decoupled in time so I can operate the chiller whenever I want to, whenever power is inexpensive, and I can meet my campus needs whenever the campus wants it. So we've decoupled those, the moment of production from the moment of need, and we've decoupled the problems in the plant from the uh, campus customers. So by having some kind of energy storage, you separate the problems from the customers, and you're able to buy energy when it's least expensive, and you're able to deliver that energy when it's most valuable. Here's a picture of our stunningly attractive thermal storage tank. It looks like it's 50 feet high. Uh, it actually is about 50 feet above grade, about another 20 feet below grade. It's about 80 feet in diameter. Everybody said, there's no place on campus for that, and we tried lots of locations, and eventually we found a place that works just fine, and it's not aesthetically a challenge. It's just fine. It works well on campus. You can see it's thermally stratified. The cold water's denser. It sits on the bottom. The warm water is less dense. It sits on the top. So to deliver cooling, we pump out of the bottom. To recool the tank, we pump cold water back into the bottom and displace the warm water. Picture of our solar field, 5.3 megawatts DC, 4.5 megawatts worth of AC, 16,000 solar panels. It takes 27 acres. Okay, This provides about 6% of the electricity that the university uses today. So that's, that's a substantial amount. It's a notable. It's not just symbolic, but it's a lot of acres to do that. This is where Princeton is different from a lot of the rest of the crowd, frankly, most of the rest of the crowd. It's not the toys that we've got in the plant. Most people have very similar equipment, <clears throat> but it's the thought process where I think the word, we're actually the defining point. We're actually the leader. Um, we take the Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland interconnection electric price. We take uh, the NYMEX price for natural gas and diesel fuel. Uh, we measure the current campus loads and the weather prediction, looking forward 24 hours in great detail, looking forward seven days in less detail. <clears throat> and then rather than just taking engineering numbers, the design numbers for uh, the equipment that we're operating, we actually measure BTUs in and kilowatt hours out. We measure KWHs in and ton hours of cooling out. So we measure in real time how the equipment performs so that we know exactly which piece of equipment to call on in real time. Uh, by comparison, we, we each buy a car, okay? We're buying the exact same model car, and you're going to run yours really, really carefully, and I'm going to beat mine like crazy. I'm hot rodding, I'm, I'm going over roads and small rocks and small animals through the woods and things like that, and the car gets broken down. They both have the exact same design numbers, but over time, one is degraded and doesn't perform as well, and one is still heat meeting the manufacturer's specs, right? So we're not just looking at the design numbers. What we're doing is we're saying we're measuring in real time. Now, we're very thoughtful and careful with our equipment, but the point is by operating them at different times, maybe at full load it works great, and maybe at part load it doesn't work so great, or over time it's degraded simply by normal operation. So we very carefully measure how does it perform at this load point and even if we have two equal pieces of equipment, which performs better under the demands that we're offering it today? So that's where we're most thoughtful and most careful. 
We also have some business rules which really amount to don't break stuff. Try not to operate the equipment harder than it should, so we're all about life cycle savings, not immediate in the moment savings. It's really about treat stuff gently so that it lasts a long, long time. Um, we also take, uh, now we've accumulated 13 years worth of historical data so we can look back and say, under these, atmos uh, under these weather conditions, at this temperature, at this humidity, on this day of the week, what energy demands did the university have? How much heating, how much cooling did we need under this circumstance in the past? So we use that to inform our 24-hour forward prediction model that says what we should do. And then this system advises us, should we generate power, buy power, do some kind of a mix? Should we burn natural gas or burn diesel fuel? Should we actually shut down for the weekend because it's so cost effective, we might as well buy power from the utility entirely? Uh, and then there's various other special conditions that this system advises us of. This is just a glimpse at the economic dispatch screen. There's about 12 different pages that the operators can look at. It is expert guidance. We still want this information to go through a thinking, trained, licensed operator's brain to make the final decision. Should I run, uh, start a gas turbine? Should I shut down a boiler? Should I run, bring on another chiller? Because again, we're all about treating our stuff thoughtfully, not extracting the highest value in the moment. We're looking for the highest value over the life of the equipment. <clears throat> the red graph is an interesting one. You can see uh, a horizontal axis. Can you guys see the green line up through that? All right, so that's a 24-hour period. Below the horizontal axis, you can see there's a downward trend on the red. That is us charging the thermal storage tank and above the red axis, you can see that there is a jaggedy line that goes up and down. That is us discharging the thermal storage tank. The green is the price of power in that 24-hour period. And you can see while we were charging the tank, the price of power was maybe 25 bucks a megawatt hour. And while we were discharging the tank, the value of power was about $250 a megawatt hour. So I bought a commodity that cost me 25 bucks and 12 hours later, I sold it or I delivered it to my customer when they would have had to pay $250 for that same commodity. 12 hours. That's pretty good ROI. That's pretty good leverage on my investment. And we do that every day, 365 days a year. We predict the lowest price and we deliver at the highest price. And we try to span that low and span that high with our power purchase and our power delivery. So here's a beautiful day. This is the perfect day. They don't always happen like this, but this is the perfect day. Uh, 24 hours of power production and power purchase on campus. Uh, 7 a.m., you can see the sun comes up. The red is the solar power production going from nothing at dawn up through maybe three, four megawatts average during the day and then dropping off by about 7 p.m. about evening. Um, then. The blue is the power production on our CHP, the cogeneration microgrid, or the cogeneration substation, if you want. About half load, seven megawatts in the middle of the night, and we ramp the throttle forward to full load when power prices exceed our marginal cost of generation, and then we back down when the power price is lower than our marginal cost. We stay running for reliability. In case the grid should trip, we want to catch the campus loads and continue to operate even without the grid. And we've done that many times. Hurricane Sandy was notable, but maybe a dozen times in the history of the plant, we've caught the campus load, the neighborhood has been dark, and we've continued to run. And that's very satisfying. That's the really good day. Uh, the purple is the power purchase on the same substation as that blue, as the cogeneration. And you see that rectangle on the left-hand side? That rectangle on the left-hand side is all the power that we bought associated with our thermal storage. So you can picture that rectangle being placed on top of the center of that curve if we hadn't had thermal storage. That's all the power we'd have to buy in the middle of the day at the most expensive when the grid is most stressed if we didn't have thermal storage. Then the green is the power that we bought on the solar PV substation. And you can see that we buy a whole whack of power in the middle of the night on the solar PV. And then the sun displaces our, solar, our uh, power purchase during the middle of the day. This is the sexy part. This is the 24-hour graph of power purchase price and how much we bought 
at that moment. So you can see the red is the price of power in the middle of the night, it's low, it peaks during the day, and then it drops down again in the evening. The green is how much we bought uh, early in the day. The big block, we're buying a whole lot of power when it's inexpensive, and you see us avoiding most of our power purchase when it's most expensive, and then buying more when it's expensive, and buying, and buying less when it's expensive. We spent 20 years building essentially means to invert the normal power purchase curve. Almost everybody else buys lots and lots of power when it's expensive and doesn't buy much when it's inexpensive. So we build up all these tools, generation, thermal storage, the ability to switch from steam to electric driven cooling and back and forth. All these assets really are load shaping, but they also give us autonomy. This is when it goes right. We got lots of really good press. We got lots of uh, solid attention uh, for Hurricane Sandy, notes from the uh, mayor, app proclamations, a lot of things in, in, uh, around the country noting how successful we were. Lots of other people were. We were notable in it, many others were very quiet, but the microgrids that Rob noted were also very successful getting through Hurricane Sandy. Uh, very nice student video, they like bashing the administration when they can. Amazingly, during the storm, they came down and interviewed a few of us and said, do you mind if we stop by and talk to you? It was, well, whoa, we got a little crisis going on here, but sure. Um, they made a really, really nice video. We're not showing it right now, but I would commend you to take a look at this. It is unbelievably high production value and very complimentary. Um, this is what I wanted to get you to, and we're gonna spend a couple minutes. This is like the 300 level. This is not entry level discussion. This is where we could take the whole national power grid. This is what we could do this is where microgrids with the power grid, not microgrids in opposition to the power grid, but dancing together is really what we want to do, how we can get the most benefit from both. So we're going to build a really, really simplistic power grid model, okay? Everybody knows that it's more complex than that. But this is to distill it just to the discussion points, right? So there's 12 uh, little energy users here. Let's say they all need 50 megawatts each. Keep it simple. We're going to build a 600 megawatt power plant to serve their needs, but we know everything breaks, right? So we're gonna build a whole nother backup and we'll put them 100 miles apart so that most of the crises, the environmental crises that hit one power plant won't hit the other or they won't both fail at the same time, okay? So I've got one and 100% redundancy, N minus one. All right, so now I've got 1,200 megawatts worth of installed capacity. Remember that number, 1,200 megawatts worth of installed capacity, 600 primary and 600 is backup. It doesn't take a lot of sophistication to understand that there's weak points in our power grid that we designed, all right? They're more complex than the real grid, but you can see that if I break either of those two points, somebody's going without power and maybe a lot of people are going without power, right? If I break either of the two power plants, things get much worse, right? So there's vulnerable points in the, plant, in the uh, power grid. This is where we want to get to. This is where we can get to. What I want you to see is now I've got those same 12, megawatt, uh, 12, 12 50 megawatt loads, but the users have prioritized things and the users have bought some, built some microgrids. So you can see, see if I can do, yeah, okay. So um, this guy has built a 100 megawatt microgrid to serve their two 50 megawatt loads. And when the power grid trips, they can, serve the, oh, they can serve their entire, ah, sorry about that. They can serve their entire uh, load without the power grid. <clears throat> this, guy ha, this guy has performed a little bit of triage. Aren't we spastic, sorry. A little better. This guy has performed a little bit of triage, and he said, you know, the furniture stored during a hurricane, I don't need to power that because nobody's going to buy furniture during the hurricane. So that's the blue building. He has built a 100 megawatt uh, backup or, or microgrid to serve his total of 200, uh, two buildings totaling 100 megawatts, and during the storm, they'll forego the non-emergency or the non-business critical needs, and they'll keep the two buildings running that are business critical. So you can see how they made their own triage. 
the utility can't see beyond the meter, so the utility can't make that decision. But they're able to make that triage and just supply their emergency needs. Uh, bottom right, the utility company's got a 200 megawatt plant, and the utility's got another 200 megawatt plant top, top left. And we could go through each one of these scenarios, but you can see that essentially I could break one or even two of the power plants here and all the customers get served, all the emergency loads get uh, served. I could break any point on the power grid and probably two points on the power grid and all the needs get served. Oh, and I've only got 800 megawatts worth of installed capacity instead of 1,200. So less installed capacity with higher reliability, with greater opportunity for lower carbon footprint, lower total energy spend, higher efficiency. It's good plus good plus good. This is where we want to try to take it. Thank you very much. So thank goodness for an energy nerd. <laughs>